story is basically about my brother Pretty Tony and myself. And it's about the birth of Queens. How Queens went from the desert, because there was nothing really happening in Queens. No real clubs, no real discos, or nothing like that. And um, it seemed like overnight we went from the desert to the oasis. You know, a lot of people hear other names, you know, but they don't really know the behind the scenes, you know, the real people that put certain people in power. But what we want to do is bring about positive, you know. We want to send a message out to the youth. The true story of how Queens came into play as a forerunner. Some people want to look at it as the drug trade. Some people want to look at it as, you know, where the official war on drugs started. Queens, I remember, you know, you used to be able to leave your front door open. Right. You remember that? Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. You know, very, uh, very, overnight. very community-wise, very like, you know, you know, everybody can, you know, play on the block and, you know, this guy's parent can go whip you, you know what I'm saying, exactly. if you're doing something wrong and, you know, the, the general, you know, the good, the happy days type thing, you know, everybody's in by the time the street lights is on, you know what I mean? And back in the days before, you know, before the crack came into our communities, you know, everybody just, you know, shot a fair when it went home. I remember when the, the sidewalks was like wooden sidewalks and dirt roads over there in South Florida. I was about three years old. Queens used to be a quiet little place and uh, some boroughs used to call us the desert. When I was like 12 and 11 years old, I remember we moved over to the Bay And every Friday night when school was out, I had to go down to the pool room. I had to take the red bus to make a bus. And I had to go down to the pool room and sit across the street and watch the hustlers. All them cats, man, used to be in my house when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? Um, Tom Bailey is my stepfather. And he's one of the pioneers of Jamaica. People, people weed their hair out like that. For instance, that's catchy. Yeah, that's really catchy. Yeah. Show them how it is. Y'all have it. You know, looking at them like the Gators, I was infatuated over all that stuff there, man. You know, my mother was even part of that scene. God bless her, but um. That was the era when this is before the crack ep epidemic, and uh, it, it wasn't all that jury and stuff like that. But when we grew up, when we grew up, we had the bucket of blood and walking to the corner meat store across the street from Dennis Cab stand. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Dennis Cab stand. Right there. Right, there. right. And I used to observe them from afar. And I remember Pimp in that pink L doll. To see the level of us talking, each one of us is a puzzle of everything. It's just that it ain't click till we hit 150th Street. Right. When I was coming up, and I was a little guy, I'm much younger than the brother here, you know? I wanted to emulate them. You know, it wasn't the era that we created, but nonetheless, there was always an era in Queens. I was in trial for murder in 1973. i never forget it. Most men from Queens that grew up in Queens, they didn't have a base. Like most niggas from Queens was hanging out with niggas out of Brooklyn, from out of the Bronx, and they wouldn't migrate with themselves because they didn't have that type of name like like Brooklyn and Manhattan and the Bronx. This only started happening in the uh, the late 70s and the 80s. It's when niggas in Queens wasn't ashamed anymore to say they was from Queens. Exactly. Nothing but thorough brothers come from out of the South Side. 
You know what I'm saying? Um, we had a thing growing up. Where if you didn't live on the block, you didn't raise up on the block and went to school together, we used to just see each other on the avenue. Right. So make it happen. That was the hangout. The live one. The live one. Everybody went to the, the live gun. Right. So that was just south side mentality. South side mentality? Yeah, I'm quite sure. Um, wherever you go, whatever state you go to, whatever town you go to, you know, every town got a south side. Right. I don't know. That stigma of south side just seems to impose its will on the people that live there, you know? The five percenters and the seven crowns, I think, were the two most prominent movements in Queens that really changed the history of Queens. Back in the early 70s, Queens had a lot of gangs. Originally, we started out as kids, me, Tony, Lance, Cat. All of it. From my part of town, we were seven crowns. Five and seven, five and seven. We're thinking about the seven crowns, the seven crowns. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? We was fools. We was off the chain. Then we went from robberies to selling drugs, from stealing cars to everything. Seven crowns is like broke down in you know, certain divisions. You know what I mean? You had certain teams. You had the seven crowns, the big crowns. Then you had the little crowns. Then you had the homicides. You know what I mean? That's how I came up under. I was a five percent from the nation of five percent. My, all my, all my first cousins grew up seven crowns. Mm -hmm. And um, I got along with all their friends, and they got along with all my friends. But our friends didn't get along. At one point, crowns were maybe fifteen hundred members strong. And like I said, that was back in the early seventies. And these are the colors that we used to wear. On our jackets back in the day, bang bang. Nowadays, the government, you know, label it as an organization. You know what I'm right. saying? Back then, we, you know, we didn't know nothing about organized crime or organization. We were just friends. It was right. one love. We loved each other. This is how everything kind of came together, right? Um, I remember the first incident that kind of brought everybody together. And I'm not gonna say total unity because the total unity didn't come until it was like 77, 78. But when we unified for a common goal or a common cause is when, do you remember when the young kid Clifford Glover got killed? I remember on 160th Street one night, this is after Clifford Glover and, and a lot of that had happened, had a funeral and everything. I think we was having a beef, the, the seven crown and the five percent. And Joanne Chester Mark pulled up with the Black Liberation Army. It was hard around five other guys, I guess, for the Black Liberation Army. And she jumped out the car. One of the changing points in my life, and I guess it must have affected a lot of other people that was there too the same way. But this little girl, she got out the car, and she actually threatened us. She said, if y'all want to fight, you want to be with each other, we'll fight you. Right? Matter of fact, the next time we hear about y'all, the five or six or seven crowns out here in Queens going at each other, we gonna come down here and fight you. It wasn't about all that gang going and all that no more. It was about, listen, we all need to eat. We all want to take care of our families, you know what I'm saying? We all want to live the rich and extravagant life. But we want the shortcut road. You know what I'm saying? Not to take nothing away from who we were and what we did, because if we didn't go through what we went through, we wouldn't be where we are now to tell a story, to make sure that another generation don't go through what we went through. Personally, I think, you know I mean, the outcome you know, of the things we did you know, later on was just beautiful, it was what we had to do, you know what I mean? Pink shade. Old ratty ass building with a pink shade. The reason we called it the pink shade because the windows had shades that was pink. Right. So we just said pink shade, the pink shade. And it stuck to the name, you know. Uh, you know, in here it might be Ray K 
Cash, Pretty Tony, Lance, Todd, and I'm telling everybody that slept in here was a store. Store, you know, he had his office in here. Matter of fact, this is where he went to jail for him. When they got home, this day, he'd never been on the street since the day they took him out this door. So, please, police finally nailed him in his mother's grocery store with $200,000 in cash, assorted drugs, and weapons. Anyway, we were the five percenters, and we wasn't known to, like, dealing with drugs and things like that. It was kind of like a religious taboo. And, um, I came over in 1979. I started coming over to 150th Street being more in South Jamaica with hanging with the crown, my cousin and the rest of the crown. And um, we start doing things and start putting things together. And he said, yo, go get some of your friends to help you out. You know, go get some of your friends to help you do what we're doing. So Prem actually met Tony and Kat before me. And um, so of course I go back to the people who I grew up with. Being told me, yo man, we have opportunity to make some money. Now, Sib and Tru and them are down here on the block working with Tony and the Pink Shade, they're getting money. And we ain't getting nothing. Can you support me? Because if I go down there, the guards that we affiliated with, they're gonna rebel and they're gonna create a problem. And he asked me to tell everybody it was all right for him to do that. We're gonna make an exception and allow him to go down to the block and get us started. And that was the, and that's the beginning of the Southern Crown and Guards relationship. My first cousin. Uh, first cousin, we grew up together like brothers. I met him back in 83 with my cousin Pat Mason on Libby Boulevard. Young fly nigga, light skin, nice hair, didn't look like the cut. A lot of these other cats that they read, that they make the songs about, and, 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 and people's names is ringing and all that stuff, if it wasn't for them, there would be none of them. You know what I'm saying? I know a lot of the rappers in our time emulated, you know. They wanted to be like, and like you said, not to glorify, but we were the stars back then, of the neighborhood. Right. Ask any dudes in the hood, man, they'll tell you, man. Cat, Lance, Tony, you know what I'm saying? They all was good dudes, you know what I'm saying? They grew up for nothing, you know what I'm saying? They brothers bounded by the crown, you know what I'm saying? They gonna be brothers for life. We always seen them come, seen them go. They always had the fancy cars, but they never was down the street. As far as street was concerned, I wasn't about them. If they had any parts of South Jamaica officially authentic niggas, or in some form or fashion, they was under the hand of motherfucking Tony and Lance. Some dudes that don't know Lance and Tony, you know what I'm saying, they might think, you know what I'm saying, that, oh, I never heard of them dudes there, you know what I'm saying, because you ain't gonna never hear about the dude on the back, you know what I'm saying, but basically, man, they is who they say they is, man. You know? But, you know, on the low, if you was in the hood, you knew who they were. Pretty Tony and Lance is my niggas. You know, you've seen him come through, you know, but you never knew that he was the man. They were some strong people back in the day, the Furtado family. I would describe him in South Jamaica on the low as like the boss of bosses. As far as like a lot of people that you may have heard of. You hear Fat Cat, different niggas like that, but um. That's one of the reasons why they last so long in the game. Because you know, you got people like John Gotti. Everybody knew John Gotti, but people don't un understand that, you know, even John Gotti had to answer to somebody. You gotta give credit where credit is due. He is, he supersedes Bump. Tony was here way before then. He was, you know what I'm saying? He was here way before that. People think a lot of things started, a lot of people think everything started with. Cat and bomb. You know, I was young back then, to say like 11, 12, you know. I watched them, you know, coming up and everything. They had cars, everything that you could think of, they had. No, I wouldn't be me if it wasn't for them, man. 
Lance taught me how to play basketball. I remember in junior high school, I used to be running crazy. He was the only one. And I ain't even gonna front on He was the only one that can talk to me. Only one. I wouldn't listen to nobody. And I respect that to the utmost, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people never realize the role that the Potatoes and you and Tony Yo play. A lot of people to this day do not know. If it wasn't for them, I know a lot of this would have never happened. And that's the truth. But really the weight, the weight and the strength behind a lot of niggas hustle. Like a lot of niggas that was shining and flossing and making a lot of noise really was reporting to them niggas on the law. You know what I'm saying? Smart, organized, lay low. That's how you should move if you in that kind in, in that game. Gotta move. Keep your shit silent. And that's how them two guys move. They were smart with their shit. You know what I mean? They the best. They always been the best. <laughs> always get you know back mean? to their hood. Real people. Picnics and everything. Real people man. do real love. Things. Mo, kid. There we Mo go. Diggity. They work their muscle for real. A lot of money. A lot. A lot of money. Supplying a lot of people. All them niggas, the big name niggas that you think was running this shit. Cause I ain't gonna incriminate niggas, but all them big name niggas you think from Queens that was doing it. That's who they was going. You know what I mean? That's who they was hollering at. When I was coming up as a shorty, you know what I'm saying? They got a little age on me. It was like an urban myth. You know what I'm saying? You might see them riding around in a Porsche or something crazy in the hood, but... Keeping it real, back in the crack era, how could you not hustle? It was like, I mean, instant rich as far as a person grew up in the ghetto. If you never lived in the project, you know what it's like to be poor. In the crack era, you went from poor to rich overnight. And you know, but we ain't, like I said, we ain't here, man, to talk about or glorify nothing, you know what I'm saying? But down here, man, a lot of things happen that change things all across the world, you know what I'm saying? It ain't too many dudes, man, you know, that started from nothing, you know what I'm saying? In a hood and turn around, had presidents and everybody else talking about them, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you just couldn't help it. You just, it just, it was like a magnet. Somehow, some way, you, you just had to get in. I'm trying to be like them. I'm trying to get, them niggas was millionaires at like 19, kid, off of weed. Oh. Time it's, it's good to see them niggas doing something positive. Pretty right you, know what I mean? So, when I met him, it was crazy because I was just looking at him like a legend. And I see that he's a positive brother. It surprised me because you hear so many things going on in the hood that these brothers are sent to. It just surprised me that, you know what I'm saying, my man is right now on some positive, real positive things going on, man. Trying to, trying to get the community back, you know what I'm saying? You know, that's why I, I love the title, Kings of Kings. You know what I mean? Because I think the Potatoes became, you know, the kings of all kings out here, in Queens. You know what I mean? Because what we came up under, we came up under adversity, straight adversity. We came outside, we couldn't do nothing but be together. But a, a, a lot of Queens, a lot of the, the birth of Queens, you know, because we was once considered the desert, you know, and we went from the desert to the oasis. So the birth of Queens had a lot to do with Pretty Tony, Lance, a lot of other people, because there's a lot of kings that come out of Queens, you know, but we're just dealing with the king of kings. Right. That's how it all started. It used to be the knock, knock on the window, then you call, put your, it used to be a gate here, you put your back to the gate, holla what you want. Two times, two quarters, which was $50 quarters back then. Uh, you get served and you walk away, you know. This neighborhood, this is Southside. Southside. South 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 Tony owned about five buildings on this block, you know. So, different crews in different spots. Everybody really worked for Tony. 150th of South Road, world famous 150th Street. That's where it all started. It used to be any given time be a thousand people on this one little block, man. Like, I remember I was a little kid, you know what I'm saying? We used to go in the game room over here, you know what I'm saying? And um, you know, grandma used to cook down here and all that shit, you know what I'm saying? In the back we used to have a pool room and all that stuff there, you know. In the end, we ended up here, 150th Street, where we started getting money, you know. We went from 
holy sneak is the gators. So that was an influence. You know, we wanted the finer things of life. And we had a shortcut route. To have 20, 30 pounds of weed back then was major, you know, major. And especially being at 12 and 13 years old. Out of the 1,500 people that was all associated gang members, at least 500 of those sold weed for my brother. So, and move quick. In my era, heroin was the thing, like weed is the thing now. You know, any and everybody is smoking weed. Back then, any and everybody was skin popping, shooting dope, sniffing dope, whatever. You know, and uh, just me and my brothers were less blessed and lucky enough not to succumb or fall to that. Because I could have easily <laughs> been a dope fiend. In other words, what made the difference between a small fry and somebody that had potential to grow was somebody that was just going on buying bundles and selling his bundles or somebody buying raw dope and cutting it and bundling it up itself. Right. And back then, everything was a, a stepping stage. It was like um, you had to learn the process along the way. It's like before you can run a major operation, you have to learn the final parts of that operation. I say that to say, before you can be a major cartel or however they want to category it, you have to understand the street level first. And once you understand the street level and then you step up, now you understand the process and you understand who gets what, what's the times to be out there, you know. In other words, if you're a store owner and you're selling merchandise, your merchandise is closed. And you know your clientele, you know your customers, you know the flow, you know the times that they, you know, the time of the month that your people gonna come in, and you know the type of money you make day to day. So once you know the intricate fine parts of your business like that, and you step up, and then you hire other people, there's no way them people down there could rob you because you played that role. It takes time to be a wholesaler, but it also takes who you know. You know how they say, if you're in the right place at the right time, you know, it's a star made like that. Right. Same way. It depends on who you know. And I'm not trying to drop drools on somebody for them to pick this up and say, oh, that's how you do it. No, because it's a dead end road, but this is how it went. What I'm speaking on is already public knowledge. That you can go to any library and pull up any, you know, old newspaper from back in the day and say, oh, wow, this is what was going on back then. Pretty Tony and Lance were getting crazy money. This was back in the 80s. Uh, they were pretty much going platinum in the street. I watched some of the, um, I watched, I be watching these hip hop shows and behind the scenes. Like a lot of videos now, they be yeah. behind the scenes and all that stuff. We were doing that 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, my man Cream had a party on Queens Boulevard. And, um, and I remember being in the VIP room with them. It was a glass door. And I remember just the, just the, the crew was in the, in, the, in the room, right? Yeah. And I remember girls banging on the glass door, banging, can we come in? I mean, banging, I like <laughs> Michael Jackson or something. So all the groupies and, and, and big parties and all that stuff that they now show on, on, on the BT and, and behind the scenes, we were doing that 20 years ago, for real. You know, but we were trendsetters. Yeah. Back in 79 and 80, we had food, links, you know, gangs. Pardon me for interrupting, but back then the game was a game. Yeah. Right now, I don't know what it is out there in society right now, but back then the game was a game. Everybody stood by their, their soldiers or whatever you might want to call them. Yeah. Yeah. All this was called the Sniff Tournament, right? That's what it was labeled. All the games took place over here at night, right? And they were big money games. First game started off, right? It started off maybe at $20,000, $25,000. But before the first quarter started, the bets was up to $70,000. You know what I'm saying? And that was just the first game. You know what I'm saying? But this, then this part picked up a, uh, you know, it just picked up a reputation that any time a game took place over here, it was considered a money game. You know? Everybody was getting money. We was labeled as the 30 million a week group. 
know what I'm saying? So, now if you said to me, yo, I'm telling you, East is gonna beat West. You know what I'm saying, yeah? How much you feel that for? Man, 50. We knew that wasn't $50. That was 50000 But the drama came into play where you got so many different crews and you got all the little shorties in the crews and they don't know who's who. And then they would be the ones, you know what I'm saying, to get into little conflicts. And before you know it, that's where the drama started. And this park here, man, it might have been like 2,000, 3,000 people out here easily watching the games. You know, little children and everything. All it takes is for a gun to be brandished. And it was a stampede. Well, that was an incident that happened, you know, uh, and it was involving some brothers out of Philly. And, um, you know, you have, you have people, like you say, in the streets, in the drug world, and they try to extort. And, you know, they try to milk money from the artists. Um, hey, Cox, just hold on a second. Let me, let me help you out. I got to add to the story. Come on. Okay, because we're together. Man. Right. All right. It wasn't that they were coming back and forth. These were people that we used to deal with, a label, a label we dealt with. Exactly. I just started my new label. They had shot Roxanne and Shantae. When they saw us hit, they came, and they also had another artist. And we were on the, on the radio at the time at WBLS, Mr. Magic and I. Right. They brought the record and said, and, and they caught me and Marley outside, and basically said, y'all gonna play this record, and we taking Roxanne and Shantae, and we staying in New York, and we don't hear the record tonight, we'll be back tomorrow. They didn't play the record, you know, they didn't play the record, and uh, lo and behold, here they come, and uh, I'm in my club because I'm a bar owner, club owner, you know, various things that I was doing, and I'm listening to the radio, and I hear over the air, Mr. Magic, he's talking, he's saying, you know, I'm tired of these dudes from Philly coming down here, I sure wish the cavalry would come to the rescue, so that was my That was our code. <laughs> that was the code. <laughs> and I just came down there, you know, with about 20 or 30 dudes on bikes and, you know. And what we kind of did was just run them out of town and inform them that they was no longer welcome here in New York. But let me say this now. Now, so I'm concerned, now I got a new dangerous partner. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was a show booked at the Encore. All right, they both mm -hmm. came. I think they was going to have to try to teach us a little lesson. However, talked us away. This, this is where it came across to us. Maybe not. I just want to let you know how everybody felt. I walked, but, but then again, my crew was deep in itself. I just, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because at that time, I had my, my artists came, G Rap, Biz. Mm -hmm. they from, and then I had the Bronx crew. So that night, everybody came to the encore. A little something happened. But, anyways, I was made to feel the door. Yo, Ty, you can could, you could leave now. Lance is here. You don't want him to see you. I know I wasn't sneaking out no door. Mm -hmm. Cause I wasn't gonna have nobody calling me yeah, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I went uh -huh. and he was at the bar and we talked. Like men. You dig know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we understood we understood one another, you understand? Know and I pre cause cause he understand, understand once again, he came to my rescue. Mm -hmm. I gotta always appreciate that, because I'm bottom line, they would have shot us that night. Wow. Period. Pretty Tony and Lance at the mole and I mean, it was like, they were true to the game. True. And, uh, you know, they say the rap game has changed a lot. So, you know, like, I've been going for almost 10 years and uh, I've been out the loop and out the mix. So it's a lot of things that I have to relearn, you know. But as far as, you know, it, it Queens go, you know, like I said, that South Side mentality, you got to be the best. Here you have it, 50 Cent Lloyd Bank. They're at the top of the field. South side, that's that mentality. That's that South Jamaica, Queens mentality. This was the showing up headquarters next to the track. The track was right across the bridge. It was our after hour spot. Okay. It's like when the bars, when we closed the bars, we didn't open up here until three o'clock in the morning. That's the time we opened. We called it the track four, because actually, um, the guy I brought it from, right? He used to work at uh, the train station, right? He used to repair trains. And he named it the track for it. And it was a catchy name, so we just kept it. Okay. No dancing, no gambling. But it was nothing but the top echelon up in here. Nothing okay. but money. You know what I'm saying? Deals. Cash, phone. We was drinking Cristal back in 79 and 80, man. Boy, everybody came. I mean, when you pulled up out here any night, you'd be able to see a half a million, a million dollars worth of cars. Any night. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it was like, between here and the track, 
I don't care what you did any night. You and you and the missus could have went out. It could have been New Year's. The night finished off between here and the track. That's where it all happened at. We took, if we took a trip to Great Adventures and we took three busloads of kids. And we didn't want the kids to think that they were just going for free. So we had a big uh, black party, car wash, that yes. type of thing. Mm -hmm. And we made the kids feel that they had to earn this trip, even though mm -hmm. it was planned for and everything. And we took all these kids to Great Adventures. And every one of the kids got in trouble stealing cones. That's some little stupid things out the store. And that was, that was talking about my new, that was the day I broke in with you guys because I was not with Tony and Lance prior to that. But that day set the mold for me. That's the day that I decided, yeah, this is where I want to be. It's like these guys was family oriented. Um, they gave outings for the kids on Easter, Easter Sunday. I remember they bought my kids their whole Easter outfit. It was a lot of things they did for the kids in the neighborhood. It wasn't just all about out there trying to make a dollar. This was a game room. We used to have the boxing matches in here. It was basically the seven crowns against the guards and shit, you know. We might have 10,000 on a fight and shit, you know. I think that first night, Pappy beat up Mike Bones in the game room. And the bet started. Was, was that one of the funniest fights? One of the funniest yeah. fights in the world. But that's when the bet started. From that fight, then they would go all these fights over so and so. We I'll put this up, man. I ain't fighting that nigga. We'll fight so and so and so. We put it. And A famous match went down in here with um, God B from Baisley against Jughead from Lakewood, which was seven crowns against the gods and shit happened right here, you know. Tim came and knocked on the door. Come and get up, get up. We got a bet, 20,000. Or something more than that, thirty thousand no, to fight Judge. It started yeah. off at twenty thousand. Right. To fight Judge. So when I agreed it was up to seventy something thousand, all right, fuck it, I'll go with that. We fought anyway the next day when we fought. The fight went two rounds. The first round we fought. Really nothing happened. We had a super old that said God be on the back, yeah, cream right, team, right. huh? He yeah, came out with tassels, he was floating like a butterfly. Right. God be. Now what happened? Second round, I'm kind of tired. But now, when we back up to, we, we, we circling, I, I remember circling, I hit the back of the game room wall. At that very time, I must have turned to see where the wall was, because I touched it, just stole the hook, right? When just stole the hook, I, he throws the hook, I raise my right hand. I catch the hook, but he throws the hook and he twists the glove so bad that the gloves popped. When the glove busted after the hook, I clenched him. I don't know the glove is busted. He with an open hand went to push me back because he knows I'm tired and I guess he feels this is the perfect opportunity to try to overwhelm me and end the fight. We had brought four pair of gloves before the fight. The, per the reason of buying the gloves was in case something went wrong during the fight with the gloves, we can change them. That was the whole purpose of that. Just so happened the second round, the gloves got damaged. Everybody seen that. The I said, change the gloves. Just didn't want to change the gloves because he thought that was the proper thing. I was. He thought it was an excuse. So he knew I was winded. He was so excited, he didn't want to stop. So, but the glove is busted and he went to swing. I threatened him. Nigga, you hit me without changing, changing them gloves, it's gonna go beyond this. That's how the fight ended. Um, I think Jug won. Matter of fact, Jug did win. <laughs> Kept it straight and shit, Jug won and shit, man. But we were still peeps, you know what I'm saying? Preem lost a lot of money there. He felt bad, matter of fact, I think Dalu ran out of here with the money, and we had to chase him to get the money. Say what? Yeah, we had to chase him to catch him around the corner. It caught his ass, though. To others, it was a historical thing. It was a big event. It was a, for, for us in our time, it was a major event. I mean, here's a street fight for up to $70,000. Now, you know, some of the other lessons you learned was a lot of these big gambles and a lot of these big rewards these guys took. If you really, really noticed it, and you weren't just mesmerized by you know, by the materialistic things in their lives. 
you started to see also the negative things in their lives. You know, a lot of people around them were incarcerated. A lot of them died, you know, um, and because we actually lived there, we saw the, the effect it had on a lot of their family members, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers, their children. So I think it just re it really educated you on, um, you know, risk and reward of the certain paths you choose. Right, right. Do you remember when the movie Scarface came out? Absolutely. How much of a role did you think that played? I think that played a very big role. You know, that's something that we all know that was put out by, you know, major studios and it glamorized that world. And, you know, at the end of the day, he, he died a horrible death. He was so cool, you know what I'm saying? He made selling drugs and being a gangster look cool. Oh, Scarface was beautiful. I remember them times, man. It affected me to the fullest. <laughs> yeah, it really did. Oh man, he corrupted the community. Scarface affected the community in a negative, negative way. I think it's obvious, you know, Scarface was a great film and it motivated a lot of people to get money, be entrepreneurs and do what they were doing. The problem with Scarface was Universal profited from it, whereas our community suffered for it. Getting rich real fast and living that I don't care life, that fearless life, and just not having any cares about anything else but getting their money. But in the, in the early 80s, when that movie Scarface came out, you know, all the young cats said, yo, you know, that's what they wanted to be, the next Scarface, you know, who put this thing together? <laughs> it was a movie that, that made all the youngsters dream, you know, all the youngsters that wanted to be dealers, it gave us a dream. Everybody want to pick up a pack, everybody in their mom's little sister, everybody see that want to grab their guns and come out and do what they do, you know what I'm saying? That's how Scarface affected the hood a lot. That was the Bible or a good impression on how to, how to run, you know, how to become like that. That movie was inspirational, man. The movie uh, basically had a lot of people uh, just taking risks and, and, and out here in the streets just doing things that um, were really crazy, man. I mean, they never put a disclaimer at the end of the movie saying, you know, this is just fantasy. Do not try this at home. That's five minutes of a, of a two and a half hour movie when the rest of it was glamorizing sex, violence, and drugs. That was 83. 1983, Scarface came out. And uh, 1983, I was right here in this park. That's when crack hit. Crack hit like 84, 85, so. You know, uh, none of us really thought we could be Scarface. But just the mentality that Scarface had that, you know, nothing could stop him. He was going to take over wherever he went, you know, it was going to be his. He gave us that mentality, you know what I mean? So we just figured the blocks that we went to, we wanted them. You know, we wanted to get this real money. Because what people saw, you know, they, Scarface from his beginning, you know, he was a rebel. He was, he was down and out. It was a dude starting up from the beginning with nothing. They saw his struggle. And he had everything at the end. And they saw his come up. Seeing him taking all that money to the bank. Mm -hmm. Now I mean, to me, for a little nigga, that shit was fascinating. That shit was like a rush. And to the people in the hood, people seen that as a way like to get on. Like, oh, snap. You know what I'm saying? Let me come on. If you watch New Jack City, Nino was influenced by Scarface. You know what I'm saying? Because in, in, in New Jack City, Nino was watching Scarface. And that, that forced a lot of niggas to start thinking big. That's how it really affected them. Like niggas that was already in the hood, that was throwing bricks or whatever, wanted to take it to that times 100, to the 100th power. I mean, it's the classic hustle movie, but to me, I like New Jack City better if we just gonna go with fucking hustling and, and, and um, you know, we just gonna go with hustling and just being a fucking idiot. On that come up, everybody just, they went crazy with, with Scarface, you know. Coming up, we was influenced by Nino, so that was the trickle down effect. Like, you know what I'm saying, in the hood, and it gave everybody a way as like selling crack and selling drugs as a way out the hood, which is not really reality. But for the most part, man, I, there's very few niggas that I know that really got involved with purchasing property, um, money laundering to the level that fucking Al Pacino played in Scarface. So, you know, I mean, the closest they came to it maybe is killing one another, but on the low, uh, niggas ain't no real motherfucking Scarface. You had a few motherfuckers. The closest nigga maybe is Tony. He had that Porsche, you know. I never forget. Soon as the movie came out, right after, like a month after the movie was in, the the movie came out. Scarface. <laughs> Who went and got that same Porsche Scarface had? My man Pazan. 
Word up. First nigga I seen with that shit. Word. That shit was crazy. Back then, ain't nobody know nothing about Porsches. And he came out with that motherfucking Porsche. Straight up, that shit looked like a spaceship back then. Oh, uh, tell me, when that movie Scarface came out, a lot of people idolized that. And they followed behind that. You wanted to know about Scarface. To me, Scarface, we was living that. So you know, um, when I seen that, we was already living that. You know, that was us, you know. Um, but um, I guess we got inspired from back Superfly. He was a hustler, he was a lover, and, and he had some kind of compassion. He just wanted, he had compassion for his brother man and his family, and it showed him like being able to, that's, I think as most every hustler dream is to make the money and, and fly off somewhere, but it really don't happen. Really I guess that's where all this came out too, you know. Um, that shit played a hell of a part, you know, uh, watching. Jim Brown and all of them. They they looking at it now and they thinking work. That's what's up. All right, cool. We're gonna get some money. We're gonna blow. We're gonna die. They gave people a false hero. You know, they gave them something negative to look up to. Cause in the end, Scarface kills his main man over his sister. He's coked up. He's drugged the fuck out. And he gets killed. I mean, there's no real victory in that. It was a bad influence. It might not have been put out for that, but that's what people got out of it. You know what I mean? And, you know, that's the only message that I think, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> the whole situation really was. I think, you know, there's, if there's more positive things for kids to look up to, Scarface wouldn't have a chance. But at the time, it was, you know, that. You know what I'm saying? So, so what? I mean, if we keep it real, we keep it real with ourselves. Um, whatever degree of fucking hustling we did, all we really, really achieved was wrecking the shit out of our own community. It just gave everybody inspiration to get paper. Uptown, Queens, Brooklyn. I mean, everybody just want to get paper, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm all that impressed with um, Scarface. Fuck Scarface. So, Al Pacino, you fucked up a lot of youths out there, man. Word up. <laughs> and fuck the niggas that produced him because we didn't get a dime of that. All we did was watch the movie run out, try to emulate him, and the jails and prisons are filled with motherfuckers pursuing trying to be Scarface. So, if you ask me, fuck Scarface. Did you respect that? They weren't taught this was they was growing up from their moms. And they didn't, you know, they didn't get these type of materials and and the type of things that they were they were moving and making money off of from from in the community. We all got these impressions from outside the community. So it's like, um, you know, they, they deal us this hand, they give us this, they take everything else away from us, and then they, they point the finger when we have to do what we have to do to survive. How was, how was prison? Prison is a place for nobody but it's very expensive and you know and that's basically lawyers and then you're looking at you know I mean a phone bill because when you're in county jails everything is a collect call you could have a $700 a week phone bill because you're trying to communicate to get help so when you're in another state and your lawyers is back in your hometown and you're trying to communicate from one lawyer to a next lawyer and you're going through third parties and fourth parties, the cost accumulates. My phone bills is like 2800 a month, 3000 a month, months. So it can be very costly. I've missed a lot of my kids' years that I can't take back. I got a young daughter now, I'm seeing her learn how to talk and learn how to walk. My other two daughters, I wasn't here to see that. Yeah, man. Prison is not a good, it's not a place to be, man. You don't want to go to prison. Mm. You know, I wouldn't send my worst enemy to jail. That's what happened. I grew up in prison, you know what I'm saying? I grew up in maximum security facilities and... Prison is not rehabilitation. Mm. You're not being re rehabilitated for anything or any crime that you may have committed. Majority of the people in New York State who are locked up are drug offenders. Actually, drug conspiracies. Mm. Drug conspiracies meaning they have no, no drugs, 
Right. No money, no nothing. I mean, one of my mans is locked up right now because a nigga snitched on him and the nigga had to say he sold a certain amount of shit right. for, the, for him to right. get a certain amount of time. And right. the nigga right. locked and was like, yeah, I copped like 125 birds from that man. That's what it all boils down to. He say, he say this, and she say that, he said this. It's enough to convict you. But that's how the feds, you know, they operate. They, they apply pressure, you know what I'm saying? And they, you know, they pick out the weakest link. And that's where they apply that pressure. And then from there, you know, it's all a domino effect. People always commit crimes, you know what I'm saying? Doing prohibition, Al Capone and all of them, you know what I'm saying? Come on, they did, they had to do. Look at the Kennedys, where they started from what they got. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Motherfucking Kennedys, they turned around, was doing all that bootlegging shit and stuff, you know what I'm saying? Now all of a sudden, you know what I mean? The president, they talk about they're the leading families in America. So if America was founded on motherfucking crime, you know what I'm saying? What does that thing say? There are things known as survival sex where people will have sex with other inmates to, for things such as cigarettes, drugs, or even protection while they're in the prisons. Um, prisoners can get drugs within the correctional facilities primarily all over the U.S. and a lot of times they don't have access to clean syringes so they makeshift syringes are used in the prisons to allow individuals to abuse drugs there. And so we have these uh, homemade or jail-made uh, syringes that are used by many people and thereby these individuals come in contact with the blood of other individuals that may contain the virus. So there is a direct uh, link as far as I'm concerned with incarceration and substance abuse and HIV. Charged with? I was charged with conspiracy to distribute a controlled substance. And your brother? We was all with the same charge. Money laundering, conspiracy, you know. They drew him up a bunch of charges. We had 32 charges, 32 counts. All, in, all, all stemming from Queens or did this go state to state? Um, from state to state. So me, I was charged with count one and count eight, which is the you know, general conspiracy charge and a money laundering charge. Those were my charges. And uh, which states did they say you guys were in? Um, they said we were in California, South Carolina, Connecticut, New York, for the most part. That's what they said. And as far as my college, how much did they say were being moved? Uh, they said 1,800 keys of Coke every six months. And they said 200 keys of dope. That's what they said. What did they say that made them start investigating? Um, investigation. Some guys that used to be affiliated got arrested in South Carolina, coming through the airport. They got arrested with 20 keys of coke. The agents asked them, you know, who did this, you know, product belong to? And they told them that they was working for a young lady named Kim Diaz in California. And they told them this same story five times. They pled guilty and got sentenced. But some uh, CIs, informants in right. New York, right, found out or got wind of these people that got knocked in South Carolina. And they affiliated the people to us. So they, in turn, went to the various agencies involved from the feds to the DEA to, you know, New York, you know, task force, whatever. And they said, hey, these guys that got knocked in South Carolina are working for the Furtados. From there, they saw the indictment against us. And with the indictment, they couldn't get one because the grand jury said, we don't see a reason to indict these people. Um, we got two guys that came through our airport they got arrested, they got caught with 20 keys of coke, they pled guilty, and they've been sentenced. They'll take a lie and they'll spread it and put it on anybody they can. The SLED agent and some of the New York officers went before a grand jury to seek an indictment. Uh, they blatantly got on the stand and lied. Say, so, hey look, this is a murderous gang that we've been after for 20 years. Yes. Standing over my shoulder behind me is the Eddie Burns uh, Community Center. One of the major lies that was told in my case was that uh, 
me and my co-defendants, my family, we was responsible for his murder, which was not true. In fact, the government knew that it wasn't true, and yet they still allowed this here testimony to come into the grand jury that we the ones, as members of an organization known as the Seven Crowns, had issued the uh, order of execution on the officer Edward Burns. They actually said we are the ones that killed Officer Ed Burns. Um, that was wholly false. It was not true. We proved that it was not true. The government knew that it was not true. In fact, we had to subpoena the attorneys that represented the people that were actually involved in that. My brethren, uh, Howard Papi Mason, had already been prosecuted and convicted. There are uh, four people convicted for that murder, and those four people were attributed to Cat and Pappy, and Cat and Pappy is attributed to us, you know, so somewhere down the line, they said, this is what we did. And all the information from the snitches, AKA rats, had already came out, and they knew it wasn't true. So uh, that was the basis of the indictment getting dismissed the first time. When you are uh, shepherdizing, and when you're researching, and you're fighting, and you're fighting for your life, it's your job to read your transcripts and to find any mistake in there. And it's a tedious process because you have to sit and read law book after law book. You have to pick up your indictment. You have to pick up your transcripts. You have to pick up everything that was said. And you have to read it over and over and over again until you find a mistake. And you might read past that mistake 20 times. But on the 21st time, it jumps out at you. I mean, it just jumps at you. Wait a minute. Look what he said. He said we killed Ed Burns. He said we are the ones that actually killed Ed Burns. Wow, look at that. Look at it. It's right there. It's in the transcripts. Look at it. And when we saw that, we was like, you know, wait a minute. These dudes said we involved with murder. They said we, you know, we are part of a... a police being executed and a whole bunch of other things that they lied about. So we had a pretrial hearing on these issues and our case was the first case in the history. Of Actually, it is the first case of criminal defendants that uh, ever been dismissed in the District of South Carolina of indictment. An indictment have never been dismissed down there. When we first got arrested, you know, the government basically kidnapped us. They came and got me about 10.30 in the evening, and I was on my way to City Island, and they rolled up on me like New York undercover. My brother Tony, you know, the government, you know, picked him up in California, well, I say kidnapped him in California. His name was never on the complaint of anything. They got me in New York. They got me and my uncle in New York. They got my younger brother in Virginia. They got another family member, why Kim and his wife in North Carolina, okay? And then all the other guys that was like state two, all of that was like a swoop in New York. So it was just like, you know, one swoop move. And uh, when we all looked up, we was like. Did they take you all to the same place? No, they took me, my uncle, and Jerry. I ended up, my first stop was uh, NBC Brooklyn. Right? And then from there, we was expedited. From there, it was like a round the world trip. The federal government has, well, when they transfer you, when you're transported or transferred, the marshals take over, the U.S. marshals. And it's their responsibility to get you from one point to the next point. But they could never take a straight line. They were always going a roundabout way. They'd take you over here to bring you over here. Instead of taking you here and then bring you over here, they take you here, then take you over here, then take you back here, and bring you back here, then take you over there. You know, so they, they try to do things where they can't be clocked. But for the most part, to me, I was kidnapped. We had attorneys here from New York and attorneys down in South Carolina. Um, for the most part, our attorneys had the attitude that, you know, we going down here and we gonna whip some tail. Uh, my lawyers even said, we don't see where you fit into a conspiracy down here. So my attorneys, they went down there with that sole uh, purpose of going down to get a victory. Even though the case was thrown out, the judge allowed the government to go back 
and tried again, and that's what they did. And um, looking back now, as you realize, the first case was thrown out based on perjury and lies and stuff like that. And then they turned around and used the same lies to go back again, which um, I'm still fighting right now to this day. South Carolina, you know, you have to look at this state in itself. South Carolina is a Confederate state. It still flies a Confederate flag. Um, it believes in the good old boy system. Um, South Carolina's motto is, we're going to hang you, and it's your job to get out this noose. Uh, anybody that's ever had any run-ins with the federal government, they know about the Fourth Circuit. South Carolina is the Fourth Circuit. Fourth Circuit starts in, it goes from, I believe it's Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Fourth Circuit. Craziest circuit. I don't care where you are in the system. If you're in the federal system and they ask you, oh, what circuit you are in, you tell them fourth, they say, oh my God. Everybody in the system knows that. So. Is it fair to say my attorney showed me out? It's even more fair to say that we didn't even have attorneys because not only did the government know it wasn't true, they knew it was true, but yet they put up no defense, they put up no fight. I approached my attorney from South Carolina and I said to her, I said, you know what? I don't hold you responsible. I know what happened. I said, I know my attorney sold me out from New York. I know he got three favors. And she looked at me and she said, three? She said, try six. In fact, what they did actually was trade our lives in prison in exchange for favors and winning cases. So she put the icing on the cake when she told me that. That's how I know they sold us out. You know, you had these big name attorneys out here and people think because they had a name, and that this guy's a lawyer, he's going to do this and do that. But what you got to understand, the criminal justice system operates on favors. And um, by us getting convicted, the attorneys got favors. The government deals with intimidation. They intimidate you with crazy numbers. They intimidate you with threats to your family members and your loved ones. We knew they didn't have a case against us, but they had leverage. You know, the government had basically threatened us and said, look, if we don't take these pleas that they're offering, they already had all the men in my family locked up, so they threatened to lock up all the women also. And they said, now, we might not be able to make these charges stick against them, but I guarantee you for the next two years, they go through the same hell that you went through, and there'll be no one near, no mothers, no fathers, no grandparents for your kids. And all your kids will end up in foster care. And we know what happens when they end up in foster care. We was forced into a plea. But the only way we took this plea is we reserved all appealable issues. And basically, that's unheard of. Most defendants, when they are plead guilty, they basically give up all their rights. They give up all their opportunities to um, come back on post-conviction or even direct appeal, which is the attack they sentence all their conviction. Our plea was basically like we went to trial because we reserved every appealable issue and every right. There are steps that you must take before you sentence someone. And uh, part of those steps are to explain what supervised release is. This is something that I worked on with my brother, uh, Big Tony. And then once you know a defendant understands what supervised release is, then he has the right to either elect to go on with this, you know, sentencing or withdraw his plea and go to trial. But when we got back to the district court, once again, because cases are resolved, you know, unfairly, and actually nobody's paying attention to the law, the judge at the time of the resentence, he didn't even know nothing about the supervised release. He didn't even know how the sentence should have been. We explained to them, and this is the judge and the uh, probation office in South Carolina, when we explained to them, what supervised release was under its new revived law in 96. It's a sentence after a sentence, and if you violate, it can and it will be reinstated. That it was a life-threatening situation. They didn't know and didn't understand what we were saying, and basically they thought we was crazy. Until they called in the head supervisor of probation, and he explained to them that, uh, Your Honor, what these young men are saying to you is exactly right, because you could be on five years supervised release 
and you can come home and you could be home for four years and you got one year left on your supervised release but you can violate the judge can put you back in jail for up to five years and when you come home you start the five year supervised release all over again and for those just hard headed it's a revolving door and that can continue for the rest of your life but what our judge did in our case was he said well I'm not going to do it that way so we said oh you're going to change the law he said, no, what I'm saying to you is, if you're home for three years and you violate, and I lock you up for one year, and you have one year left, then that's all you have left. So we said, so okay, that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna change the law. You know, he said, no, I'm saying this is what I'm gonna do. Right now, we still fight right now. And people look at me and they say, well, we home, man. You know, what you fighting about? What they're expecting is that because we're on the street, we'll give up the fight. The fight goes on. Even though we're free, the fight still goes on. Because what you gotta understand is that even though you prosecuted for the drugs or whatever and you do your imprisonment portion, at the end of that term comes a uh, term what they call supervised release, which most commonly is known as like a parole. But when I got sentenced, I got sentenced to 15 years plus five years supervised release. That five years supervised release exceeded the agreed upon time. We put this thing together and uh, it resulted in our sentence being reduced by five years. That issue is in the law books and it can help everybody. And, uh, the site number is 191 Fed Third at page 420. For Title versus U.S. They can dig it up. For anybody looking on and anybody listening, don't depend on your, your legal team. It's you. You have to do this. Let's say a regular uh, lawyer or um, all they have time is to you know maybe eight hours nine hours a day that's what they dedicate to you know researching and putting a defense together but you on the other hand when you fighting for yourself you got 24 hours in a day I mean my personal opinion is you can fall back and relax and you can do you know whatever you want to do but if you're going to be in this game, you know, this ain't no rap record. If you're going to be in this game, this game is real. And if you're going to play, you got to pay attention. Some people choose to go out on the basketball court and just play ball or play handball, play football. You know, a lot of these young cats nowadays choose to just sit up under the TV. You watch some videos as the year go by and your family die out. Yeah, die out because when they die, you're not going to no funerals. People going to die. Time moves on need to be working on your case and it's, it's, it's a shame man. And not realizing that hey man these people just gave you a football gun. 10, 15, 20 years for these gun charges, they're not going to the law library, they're not working on their case and they know their people is poor, they know they don't have no money, they haven't saved no money to hire a lawyer but instead of working on their case you watch some VT videos and all that. It has been 31 years since the enactment of the Rockefeller drug laws in the state of New York. But today there's a tragic sense of urgency uh, concerning these repressive and unfair laws. The Rockefeller drug laws is very disproportionate. You can't tell me that if you get caught with a, a 22 or you get caught with an AK, it should be any different. They're both guns. I'm pleased, therefore, to be responsible for addressing the topic today, spinning the truth in the face of injustice, raising public awareness about the negative impact of the Rockefeller drug laws on African Americans and Latino Americans. First I gotta say about the Rockefeller drug laws, it's totally unfair, it needs to be changed. A lot of my friends have been locked down for small amounts of drugs and they're not really criminals, but when they come out they end up being criminals. In May of 1973, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York at that time, signed the legislation providing for extremely harsh prison terms for possession of relatively small amounts of illegal drugs. Over the past 30 years, the effect of these laws, known universally as the Rockefeller drug laws, has been devastating. The impact of these unfair and unjust laws has been particularly harsh on black, brown, and poor white communities across the state of New York. 
the the prison population in New York quadrupled since like the early 80s, since the crack era. So when the crack era came, the prison population in New York in the early 80s was only like 30,000. Now it's over 75,000. 96 percent of everybody in prison today in New York, under the white color drug laws, are black and Latino. That's not right. I just want to say that this has been going on for too long. It's been going on for 30 years now. And this is a, a situation that has tragically taken a lot of people's lives, mostly the lives of minorities. When you have the same amount of crack and the same amount of cocaine, you get more time for the crack and less time for the, for the white powder. And that's incredible when at the same rate, uh, whites use and sell drugs as much so I think that says it in itself is that there's a difference in those going to jail and those not going to jail. But the more important thing is that we find through DNA and, and new technology how many African American males especially that are in jail that really are innocent. You know, first time offenders can get 15 years and they could be drug users, not drug sellers. We're not here today advocating drug use. We know that drug dealers who are violent should be punished. But the one who's walking around with five cracks in his pocket is not a kingpin. I'm with Russell Simmons, and I mean, whatever Russell says, I'm going to ride with him. <laughs> Make it fair, but it's also fair to let him know that you shouldn't use the drugs because I'm a perfect example. You know what I mean? It's like if things I've went through in my life and things I've done, I'm not ashamed of it, but I'm also not condoning it. But the way these laws are concerned now, it could have been me three years ago or five years ago, and I would have got coming home with, with my personal things, you know what I mean? And I could be put away for 15 years. There's situations where people have been affected by the Rockefeller law that they didn't know, whether it was a bad drug habit or they were carrying something for someone else or just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Rockefeller drug laws require me mandatory minimum prison sentences of 15 years to life, even for first-time nonviolent offenders. They're archaic, arcane, and they need to be changed or completely done away with. A lot of people we know been locked up for many years. We're not saying they're not wrong for doing what they're doing. We're just thinking that they should be punished right for the crime. A lot of people in jail for for a little bit of drugs, got more time than murderers and people who really should be in jail for a long time. Listen, I know people that killed people and then came home, people that just got busted with a little bit of crack. You know, my personal experience is I did seven years for a sale under that same um, Rockefeller law. I served nine years on a 15 year to life sentence, virtually paralyzed from the neck down. As a whole, I feel it's really damaging because they're giving people too much time for fresh, you know, fresh time offenders. These are laws that are racist and discriminatory, and they, what they do is they target our community and our children and our neighbors and make sure that they stay in jail for longer periods than what's necessary. i never seen such uh, nonsense when you can give someone a life sentence for having a kid crack, and he can get five years for having a kid cocaine. Cocaine is cocaine. It don't make a difference. Judges have no discretion. In other words, they took judicial discretion out of the law. One of the things that the enactment of the Rockefeller drug laws in 1973 did, a judge looking at the mitigating circumstance of a first-time nonviolent drug offender could not say anything. It was up to the prosecutor to decide how you charge. But everybody knew that the real way to strike a blow at Rockefeller drug laws is to get out of DA. That means adding judicial discretion back into uh, the new law that we demand. Let's try to get a thing where individual district attorneys could, in essence, agree to reestablish the principle of judicial discretion in their county. That is to say, they, you know, the DA is the highest ranking law enforcement right. official in the county. Right. They could agree to cut a deal with, they would sign an agreement essentially with the court system in their county and they would say for the following kinds of uh, drug cases, it could be all drug cases or it could be some experiment, right. we are giving up the power of the DA to decide 
how long someone goes to jail and giving it back to the rightfully ordained right. uh, what do you judges. call that? They're calling that the DA opt-in. New York is one of the worst as far as the sentencing of low-level drug uh, dealers or users. Right now, you got dudes that's taking millions and millions of dollars from corporate America, and they're getting a slap on the wrist. You know what I'm saying? For doing what they do. The whole uh, Enron situation, they'll be out in 10 years. I got people that'll be out in 20. You got people from Enron embezzling billions of dollars, getting a fine. We don't want to send drug dealers who have five cracks in their pocket or drug users to jail for longer than rapists and murderers. I live right near Rikers Island, and if you could see women who have been sentenced to such a long time in prison. But for one mistake in her life, has pretty much left children who are motherless. The first time I ever got caught with drugs, I think it was about 250 uh, caps of cocaine. When I went to court, they offered me five to 15 years. I had never been in trouble ever in my life. That's difficult on children and on families. Now, you want to talk about some way to destroy a man's family? Well, that's how they destroyed my family. And where I think it, you see it most often is when grandma becomes mom when your aunt becomes your mother, where your uncle is now your father. They took me away from all my family, broke me down. I got nieces and nephews, sons and daughters. They don't even know me, because I've been away so long. So we're not encouraging nobody to sell drugs or use drugs or nothing like that. In fact, we encourage you to leave that alone and stay in school. But we have to voice our opinion, because a lot of mothers have suffered a lot of little kids don't have their fathers today because they were punished unfairly. People concentrate a lot on Class A, but the huge amount where the most time is, is in Class Bs. If you really did want to strike at the heart of Rockefeller drug, you know, do something about these Class Bs. So like you could get 25 to life if you did a Class A felony, but maybe under Class B, you might get 5 to 15, which is still ridiculous. 8% have one of their parents in prison today. Across America, public schools don't have books, don't have adequate desks. I, I went to a school out in Queens, Charles. People standing up, don't have no place to sit in a public school. We definitely take education, but when books and classes is overcrowded and all that, it's hard to get education. And nigga, street smarts come before nigga see school. Yet, we will take more money than to build more schools, we're building more prisons. And then they take the failure rate. Anybody doesn't pass the third grade reading test, they use that failure rate to extrapolate how many juvenile prisons that they're going to build in the state of New York. Because they know, poor well, if you can't read by you in the third grade, you're going to have a hard time making it out of the eighth grade. You'll have a hard time making it into the ninth grade. You're going to have a hard time staying in school. I'm a New York City kid. I grew up and we used to meet our friends on the corner. But today what happens is that the, the drug pusher infiltrates that. So a lot of young kids who are innocent, who have nothing to do with a drug sweep comes along, they get picked up to and thrown in jail. And uh, it's so wrong. The entire system top to bottom, everybody that's been involved in government, even many judges that have had to enact the laws feel uncomfortable with the way they are now framed. And it's actually framing young people that have been put in undifficult choices by their community. So we're in favor of, I'm in favor of getting them changed as quickly as possible. We're going to pray, most importantly to God, that God gives the governor the right state of mind to have the courage to do what he's supposed to do to turn this tragedy around. And it's up to us and it's up to y'all, the young people in New York, to keep making noise. Keep making noise until they turn this law around. We've been pushing from our end in the city council do resolutions on a, a bi-monthly basis to encourage the governor to stop the, the uh, rhetoric and actually sit down and write the language to come up with a final solution to change the law. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, energy about it. I think the energy starts again whenever we talk. 
If we don't talk, then the energy goes away. Definitely. It does not mean that we are in favor of everybody getting drugged up or dope up. We are opposed to drugs, okay? But we are also opposed to a society that will try to use, because most people first get involved in drugs not because they want to get high, because they're trying to sell some drugs to make some money because of poverty. Well, the whole system is unfair, especially the Rockefeller drug law. Yeah. I'm for anybody trying to change something like that where nonviolent guys are getting too much time and, and you know what it is, it's just modern day slavery in the prisons. For the Latin community on the Rockefeller drug law, we are struggling and if we struggle together it's, it's a little bit less the pain. The, we, can, we can overcome many things. If we can show you get better outcomes, the more humane outcomes, it's better for the taxpayers. I mean, there's a hundred different ways. Now, you've got to also combine this with genuine treatment programs. You actually need to combine it with jobs and all the other things that we know are the real, the real answers to, uh, you know, the drug problem. But what's critical to understand is the Rockefeller drug laws are not preventing crack cocaine from being distributed, sold, and made. All it's doing is putting the people that are on the low end of the totem pole in jail. They, they, they let the drugs get over here, you know what I'm saying? They let us sell drugs to get out the hood. They put it here in the ghetto for us, and as soon as we touch it, they want to lock us up forever, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't target the Colombians who ship the drugs here. It doesn't target the people who are really making substantial money and avoiding jail time. Studies conducted over the last 20 years have established that the Rockefeller drug laws have not succeeded in making New York safer or reducing drug use in the state. Today, illegal drugs are more readily available in New York State than they ever were when the laws were first enacted 31 years ago. Moreover, sentencing young, nonviolent, first-time offenders to limited incarceration terms under the Rockefeller drug law has ruined untold young lives. Why people are incarcerated, they usually have to survive in prison. A lot of times this means making alliances with people for protection. A lot of times this means getting money from your family to pay for protection. But what people do a lot of times is they either sell drugs as a way to protect themselves or to make money in prison. And also they trade in, in drugs uh, for sex, which is a vehicle for the, the transmission. And set too many promising youth down the path of crime by exposing them to hardened criminals in the prison system. I don't think many people understand how serious it is and that we're not talking about one to three years as we might on cocaine in powder form um, or heroin, which is a far more addictive drug, ironically. Um, we're talking about life sentences and we're talking about people in their 20s in their you know late teens going away for the rest of their lives and that's a significant thing that we've all got to do a better job of letting people know that this is what we're talking about we're not talking about a few years here we still won't have uh, reenacted judicial discretion uh, under the current stuff that's being negotiated which is why, why we're trying for this what we think is the next best thing, which is let's try to get judicial discretion in some counties, show that it works, and then use that as a springboard to win it statewide. Some of the people that originally voted for it are now saying, we did the wrong thing. We need to make some changes. Um, one of the main reasons is the District Attorney's Association, who's put a lot of pressure on some members of the legislature that this should not be changed because they do not want to give up any powers. They don't. They think the power should lay with them rather than with the judges, which I disagree with. David Soares worked for um, DA uh, Paul Klein. And Paul Klein's father was known as the hanging judge. Maximum John. Maximum John. He took this line that it's possible to be tough and smart on crime, not tough and stupid. And our view is that Rockefeller is tough and stupid. David Soares is a perfect example of the people not going away. Rockefeller reform is something that's been very necessary for many, many years. They've been around for 30-something years. They've disproportionately locked up 
African American people and Latino people. We don't do drugs any more than anybody else does. Right, right. So I think the movement for reform is being seen in the presence of David Suarez being the new DA in Albany County. The people have spoken. Mandatory minimum sentences is just not a New York problem. It's a national problem. But what happened 31 years ago, after New York enacted the Black Color Drug Laws, other states, California, Texas, Florida, also enacted mandatory minimum sentences. If we can change the Rockefeller Drug Law, which is the godfather, the grandfather of mandatory minimum sentences, it will help us in other states. And it's double jeopardy also, because what the government does is they take your criminal history. That's how they determine. PSI. Right. They take your criminal history. They look back and say, okay, well, this is what you did 10 years ago, and this is what you did 15 years ago. And you say to yourself, yeah, I committed a crime. I went to jail. I did my time. And I paid my debt to society for that crime I committed. But they take that same crime that you committed and then use it to enhance you and move you over. And that's how they deal with your criminal history. So you can go from 13 months to 37 months just because of your past history. These guidelines are based on the grid that put a person at a certain point, certain levels and things like that. And most of those levels are raised or lowered based on different information that the prosecutor might choose to use against the defendant. Now the majority of brothers that's locked down is based on, their sentence is based on what they call hearsay and really no evidence at all. And this is all formatted into the guidelines that amount to extremely long prison sentences. My mom just came home, 14 years, mm -hmm. uh, mandatory minimum. Uh, you know, she came home last May. Um, the Rockefeller drug laws are evidence of a war that's been, uh, you know, a protracted war that has been um, engaging our community for a long time. A U.S. imposed illegal drug trade that we get blamed for, mm -hmm. where they pump the drugs in and they pump us out by the hundreds of thousands and fill up the prisons to warehouse and build shit that, that white people use in their homes like, like exactly. clothes and yeah, toys for their kids and... And so um, it's a racket. It's, it's, it's a huge economy based off what we're dealing with. And they gave it a quote unquote name, the Rockefeller drug law, to make it seem legitimate. On a cost basis analysis alone, that it's not effective. Um, right now, the prisons are overflowing with nonviolent offenders, first time offenders, um, who could be better served in their communities with their families and who are amongst the most rehabilitative people in prison. You know, as a prosecutor, you're, you're a gatekeeper of the criminal justice system. Right? And when I think about a gatekeeper, I think about a person who hit the doorman at a club, right? Letting certain people in, right. not letting certain people in. There's a difference between being a gatekeeper and being a doorman. A doorman, you're opening the door for everyone that's approaching, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, being a prosecutor means that you're qualifying that person that's in front of you to determine whether or not this person is worthy of this type of punishment right. or worthy of something else. Uh, we know that we can always do this because we have been you know, letting people through right. you know, what's behind door number one. Right. Um, I think that we need to explore what's behind door number two. I mean, you had the case where you had a young lady in Maryland who was tied to uh, a drug dealing, uh, a crew of uh, drug dealers, and uh, she had actually gotten caught, and she actually ended up getting stiffer time than, let's say, the leader of the of that little drug crew that she belonged to. So, so you can get a DeLorean, get probation for trying to sell X amount of keys of coke, and a brother from the hood who probably done got a couple of convictions since he was a juvenile, just trying to come up. He got to get life for 10 or 15 uh, vials of crack. So, I mean, you do the math. It don't take much um, intelligence to see. I come to the table with a, with a different approach. I want a balanced approach. You know, I want to prevent minnows from becoming sharks. Exactly. And so, with our youth that are coming in, um, it's about hearing them out. You know, looking at looking at what's beyond just sitting on this piece of paper. You know, that's on this piece of paper. 
paper. You know, if you're a case processor, all you do is, okay, you give it a number and you move it out, right? right? right. Um, but if there is an opportunity to do some good, if there is an opportunity to save some lives, then we should be exploring those opportunities. There's a new sheriff in town. And his name is David Sutter. I'm glad that people are starting to take interest now and people with power and money and power are starting to make some noise and mm. uh, try to bring some change about it. Cause One of the things I'm working on, and I'm working with Russell on this other thing. Anyway, I'm really working with this three strikes thing first though, you know what I mean? Because I'm a three striker myself though, oh, wow. okay. you know what I'm saying? I ain't did, I ain't turned around and did no time in about 14 years, okay. you know what I'm saying? And uh, they can turn around and uh, I can go to jail for something real small, mm. and I've been about peace and turn around and just strike me out, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's... So I think my message would be that selling drugs and being on a corner will eventually get you before that judge. And I'm the only thing that I hope for for you, if that's your decision to do that, is that we do get to eliminate Rockefeller and that you do get the second chance that even if you are on the corner selling drugs, that you deserve. In America, it's a capitalistic society. The greatest thing about this country is you can buy whatever you want. And the worst thing about it is you can buy whatever you want. This brother spent many years in prison on the both the Rockefeller drug laws and federal drug laws. I've been in jail many times, 30, 40 times. You know, but all my stuff was for civil rights fighting, you know, they, they just will lock you up because they don't like you, you to uh, uh, challenge their authority. But I want Brother Lance, I'm going to give him a few minutes. Please listen to him because he's a living example of why we need to change uh, the Rockefeller drug laws. Let's greet Brother Lance. You need to pay attention to what's going on with the Rockefeller laws, the federal sentencing guidelines. All of these things are very important and it's detrimental. You know, so I'm not going to take up too much time, but I just wanted to stop in and let y'all know that pay attention to what the brothers are speaking about, because your life depends upon it. The government has plenty of room. The room is not being made for me anymore. Understand that it's not even about the Rockefeller drug law. It's about making money, getting free labor, <laughs> right? Whatever it takes to get somebody in jail is what you do. And that's and, just a head count. And now that penitentiaries are moving to the private sector, corporations can own them. It's really getting ready to get funky. A lot of people that's invested in uh, mutual funds and stuff like that need to go into their portfolio and see what they're really investing in because they invested in jails and don't know it. Most people think that after you're arrested for a felony in this state, it takes away your voting right. It does not. But you have to reassert your voting right. If you go around saying, I've lost my voting right, and don't assert it again, your voting right, then you, it will be permanent to take away from you. Nobody's going to knock on your door and say, hey, uh, I'm glad you served your term. You know you can register to vote again. We have to do that. Since we can't, you can't beat it with money, then you got to beat it with numbers. Okay. Okay, that means we all have to get together, all right, to make the numbers beat the money. Because money comes from a few, all right? Numbers can beat the money if we all have one head, one mindset. Mostly we're cross-endorsing, we're throwing our support to the Democrat. Sometimes, of those 1,700, probably 1,600, we're saying vote for the Democrat, but vote for them on the working family's line. So when Election Day rolls around and he gets 42% as a Dem and the Republican gets 45%, 
and the last 13 comes in on the working families line, and he wins 55 to 45. See how that works? Two parties fusing on one candidate. Um, that candidate owes us 13% of his or her hide. That's right. And we want to take it out in Rockefeller reform, in minimum wage, in health care, whatever the issue is that the members of the party in central Brooklyn, in Buffalo, whatever, whatever they're working on, that's what we want the accountability towards. You vote because you want to put your own people in office. You also vote because you want people to pay attention to your agenda, whether they look like you or not. They ain't thinking about you. Imagine if your girl takes 50% of your check and just breaks out and just spends the money. Would you come home? Let me ask you a question. Unless you're a punk and you're a man, you might at least say, like, honey, like, did you spend my money? What'd you buy, right? At least, you're at least going to ask her. These niggas, they take your money. They make decisions for, for you on what they think you want. But they don't even do that. It's worse because you ain't talking to them and they're not even worried about what you think you want. Right. They're just taking your money. They may be bombing innocent people. Governor Pataki, he owes his first gubernatorial uh, win to the conservative party because they provided that little margin. So in this state, you know, you can run on these different lines, people can see you where you are, but it's added together. That's power, because then people can see your vote. They know you made the difference. They know that. And that's where, when, when folks talk about who actually is calling the shots, we now have a vehicle to call the shots. So most of the time we cross endorse or fuse with the Democrat. Occasionally we'll fuse with a decent Republican if we can find one. And every now and then we'll run our own standalone third party candidate against the two major parties if the major parties won't put up anybody decent. That's why young kids out there gotta vote. When you turn 18, you know it's a real serious game. Your vote does count out here. You know what I'm saying? I just I just voted this year for the first time. My grandmother votes every year. I said, I've registered to vote, I've voted one time. Because the same way y'all run out there, you know, y'all go cop the terror squad album on, you know, July 27th. You can run out there, you know, in a second, and whenever else vote, it takes like two seconds. You owe it to yourself to get involved and push to make change. The policy that these two gentlemen are going to implement in the next four years is a policy policies that are going to affect my children in the future, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, when they're no longer in office. So President Bush is being paid by me, by you, and you, and you, and you, and you. You have the power in this country to tell him what to do. Democrats fought us. Democrats told us, y'all need to stop. Don't do that. You can't win. You're rocking the boat. When we ran in the primary, first we were ignored. They laughed and said we were silly and crazy because they believed that racism was alive and well and that in a county with 4% people of color, there's no way a brother of color was going to win. We won the primary, crushed them. One of the things that we're trying to do, and we just passed a bill in the city council that as soon as a child turns 18, um, when they graduate, they should get a voter registration form. Um, another thing that we've been doing is holding and going to different schools to make sure that the schools have uh, voter education forms. Why do we need to vote? We need to vote to make sure that government is fully representative of us. We need to make sure that when government and politicians and elected officials and people come forward and say, we want to represent you, we want to know what their platform is. Register to vote. I know, you know, you feel like it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It really does. The more of us out there registered, out there voting, understanding how some of these things work, not just getting into it to get into it, but understand how some of these things work with your congressman and your councilman and all those little things like that. It makes a difference at the end of the day where they're going to be putting that paper in your community. We, we definitely support King and Kings. We think what the Fatalos have done is it's just mind-blowing. So we feel as though that there's a kinship. Uh, we want to support the film in every way we can. And we want those that go to see the film to know that the Working Families Party uh, is here and we'd like to have their support or at least their notice and attention. Fortunately for me, 
The best thing that, that, could, that could ever happen to me was back in 1995. I got arrested September 14th by the feds, me and my family. And immediately we realized that the way we was living, it wasn't right. And um, what I'm here to do now, part of this documentary, is to help give back, to help close that cycle so the youths don't go down that same road of destruction that we went down. If I can change, they can change. Uh, me and my brother was presently involved with the hip-hop summit youth council, hip-hop against drugs, we volunteer our services to come out and speak. That's what's great about lads coming home is that it shows that just because you come from nothing doesn't mean you have to return to nothing. And now he has a greater product and a greater message and a greater story to tell. It's going to really impact lives beyond our imagination. He was positive back then, so this ain't nothing new. This ain't no front. He was like this back then. Lance kept it real. He keeps it real. He kept it real. He was like this. And what was it, 99? 98, 99. I was in 98, right? 98, 98 99, something like that. We, the, the little time we spent together, listen to him. He know what he's talking about. We realized that, you know, as in, as in the prison system, you hear so many times, oh, the white man locked me up, the white man did this. That's, that's not the truth. That's a lie straight from the pits of hell. Me being locked up, came from myself. I planted the seed which was doing wrong. I was 17 when I went to penitentiary, man. I came home when I was 29, man. I mean, that's 12 years, man, of my life, you know, just completely demolished for, you know, for basically nothing, man. You know what I'm saying? So, what I want to say to you, man, I, I, I want to tell them straight up and down, listen to some of them positive rappers, man. Listen to something, you know, some things they got to say. You stay away from the drugs. You can see the guys on TV doing the fancy dances with the gold chains hanging, talking about how they get high and how they do this and that. That's not cool. That's not the way to go. Because all drugs are going to do is ruin your future. Well, one thing I can tell you about drugs is either medication or meditation. And that's how I look at it. You know, either you can medicate with drugs to get your mind where you want it to be, or you can do it the, uh, the, more, the way that it would guard our day, which is meditation. So for me, I found out through all the times I was taking drugs, I really just wanted to be at that, at that heavenly place. And sometimes drugs make you feel like you're at that heavenly place, but it's not, it's, it's like bowing down to an idol. Here you are using this drug to get where you want to get, and you can be using God to get where you want to get. If you could hustle on the street, you could hustle on the music business, you could hustle on Madison Avenue, Fifth Avenue, construction site, whatever you got to do. This right now, yo, stay, stay with the basketballs, man. Pick up a microphone, learn how to rap. Stay in school, be a doctor or something, man. We got a lot of other things, a lot of other ways to get out this hood, get out this ghetto without selling drugs. We all know the ghetto superstars. They, they're only hot for a few seconds. So, you know, we're all trying to be 60, 70, 80, 100 years old, and that lifestyle and that uh, road doesn't lead to that. I've been around people my age, 16, 17 year old, 45, 50 years to life. And that's part of, that's what gave me, and those dudes made one mistake, one split second changed their life forever. So that made me look at myself and be like, dog, do I want to live like that? Do I want to go home and end up coming back here for the rest of my life, or do I want to be a, a productive member of society? I changed my life by giving back. We have the Band Nation Foundation, which helps the, the, the children of incarcerated people. Dope dealers on the corner of my neighborhood mm -hmm. helped me out, okay? Because they, whether it was throwing a rock at me to keep me away from what they were doing, because right. they knew my mom, right. they knew my dad. And so when we talk about opportunities to be a role model, it doesn't matter who you are, you can be a role model. Doing the right thing, uh, there's no, there's no uh, um, you know, job title. It ain't hard, you know what I mean? We in a land, a land of opportunities. If a kid from a third world country can come to the United States of America and become a, the Albany County District Attorney, then, you know, anyone can do it. Right. You know, all of us are uh, only uh, reflections of the people we hang out with. You know, and if, if you're hanging out with, you know, people who are you know, driving the car to hell, right, you, it's like you're there with the door locked. You, you're going where they're going. You look at where your man is going, that's where you're going. If you turn to your man like every day, you say, damn, man, you're going out. That's where you're going. <laughs>
You gotta ask your friends, why y'all do that shit every day? <laughs> you know, you collect you with them, that's your karma too. Keep away from the drugs and the drug selling and all that, because you know, it's only like two roads you can go that way. That's definitely in jail. I always speak to the youth, especially if, if, if we can be uncensored, especially if we can be as candid as it should be, especially if we can be as candid as Cameron was in his role and paid in full, mm -hmm. and we can really give it to him from our, from the barrel of our gun, which is our position is political power. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, know, you should know that, that we always look to the youth to control the market. That's where it's always going. And there's so much opportunity out there, and so many scholarships that I mean, I, I don't see a reason to actually take that bad turn. I really don't. Not anymore. I mean, back in the days, I can be tempted by it, but now, it's not there anymore. Everybody doesn't make it as a rapper. Everybody doesn't make it as an NBA star or make it to the NFL. People with great talent don't make it. So school is something to fall back on. Find out what you like doing, what you're good at. Knowledge is power. Uh, knowledge is power in any aspect. And that's what we have to learn more is to get the knowledge in all the areas that our counterparts have the knowledge. And so I think our youth have got to be more proactive rather than reactive. Uh, we find ourselves often being reactive. It's good to have some type of street knowledge so you don't succumb to those pitfalls and those traps. But the best knowledge is to have education. The whole concept of this country's education, man. If you got an education, you can beat the odds, man. But I truly believe, I truly believe from the bottom of my heart, if you are not an educated person, you are just gonna go so far. Stay in school, man, get that degree. Go to school, go to college. There's more of us in prison than in school. That's crazy. For those who are disadvantaged, learning disabilities, poverty is facing uh, I think they got to recognize they got to stay in the school, they got to learn, uh, and part of this summit is to give them a better chance. Basically, you know, I mean, I think the important thing is just to, to realize that you have choice and that you have a mind that's yours. Everything is not chasing after what's on television or in the magazines. You have to understand that it's a real world out there, and y'all just got to try to be intelligent with y'all, be smart. Uh, get your education. I know it sounds cliche. You haven't turned back to where you come. You've created a whole new cipher or reality from what you had before. Right. See? Right. So you started with the 180, but now you want to go another 180 because you want to go over what you did and you want to squash what you did before. And you want what to submerge is the righteousness that you want to prevail. Exactly. This is the epitome of the teachers of the Amblasia right. about because redemption is a purifying force. So we are fulfilling what the scripture says. We're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So you were born into a sin that you didn't create, an iniquity that you didn't want, but it became a part of us. And therefore now you've learned to throw that off now. And now you have now turned the negative into a positive tool for substantive change. And that is the most beautiful thing that could be done. See, look, the one who went down can always come up. But the one who's been up, we wonder how they handle if they ever go down. Oh, yeah, exactly. You understand? Exactly. So it's a blessing that we came from down up right. rather than being up not knowing how right. we're going to handle the fall. Right, because if you've never been there, then you didn't have go. a testimony. And you never get back up sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. So for the young people that's out there looking on, mm -hmm. I mean, could you enlighten and just share a positive message out there to the young people? Well, I say to all of those who are young, you're going to be older one day. So you got to take stock of your life in your youthful years and not waste that time and wait until you are older and now you wake up and the light comes on the light should come on now don't be like the old heads you see today because many of them are too old and can't change anything so you do it now in your youthfulness in your virility to make the kind of changes that you need to make whether you be a young man whether you be a young woman when you are older in your sunset years you want to be able to savor and look back at the righteous deeds you did and not always look back at the negatives and say, you know what, I wish I shoulda, coulda. Right. No, let's do it right now. Yeah, I was approached many times about what we were gonna do in order to beat game over. That was the challenge, to top game over. 
I didn't know how I was going to do it. Because after watching the Rich Porter, Alpo, AZ story, and seeing that 10-year-old kid, Darnell, with his fingers cut off, it, it, really, it really hurt me to see that. And after watching that, I was inspired to launch a concentrated effort to educate young kids about the dangers of substance abuse and these drug laws, like the Rockefeller federal drug laws. I approached Russell Simmons, who we've been doing a lot of work with, and I told him we need to do something about these laws and about drugs in our school and around our communities. And we began to work on the Rockefeller drug law to reform them and to get involved in programs in schools and communities to educate kids about drugs. And at that stage, we decided to do an anti-drug documentary about drugs. And I knew that if I could use the celebrity community to raise awareness and reinforce our message, that that was a win. We went out and in the middle of shooting this anti-drug documentary, I got a phone call. A friend of mine said Lance was on. And lights started flashing because Lance Potato, I knew that if there was a story to be told about drugs, and if there was a method and a way to educate kids, I knew that if I could get the Fatados to come forward and to tell their story about Queens and the drug game, that I had a win-win. And so I approached Lance and I asked Lance, you know, would he be interested in working with me on educating kids about drugs? And he said that he wanted to do the story of his life and he also wanted to educate kids about drugs. And I knew that the Fatado family, you know, this is a family that was behind Fat Cat, Supreme, Corley, Pappy Mason. They were the ghetto superstars. And, and these were the guys that were major figures and they were authentic. And I knew that if I could get some authentic guys like them and put them together with some artists, that together, that would be a message for kids. And out of the borough of Queens, I mean, when we did Game Over, Game Over was Manhattan, but Queens, Queens launched the careers of a whole lot of artists. I mean, put hip hop on the map, Run DMC, LL Cool J, Nas, Russell Simmons, FUBU, Lloyd Banks, 50 Cent, all of that came out of Queens. Also, Queens is where the official War on Drugs got started. TNT Task Force. If there's a TNT in your community, it started out of Queens when Ed Burns got killed back in 19, I think, 88. So I knew that if I could tell the story of Queens like I did Manhattan with Game Over, and that if I could take some authentic ghetto superstars like the Potatoes, get them to tell their message, and link them with some celebrities that together that I would be able to effectively educate young kids about the dangers of substance abuse and the Rockefeller federal drug laws. When I sold that story to Lance, he was with it. This is something he wanted to do. And together, King of Kings was born and also the Hip Hop Reality Education Tour. Is there a correlation between education and incarceration? Of course there is. 80% of those in prison are high school dropouts. According to the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, New York City school kids are underfunded. In upstate New York, almost two-thirds of the prison population are from New York City. Now, if the kids in New York City are being underfunded, and almost two-thirds of the prison population are from New York City, you put one and one together. So I'm saying that to say to you young people that you got to go to school but you can change the laws around you. I was so happy to look at the Daily News and the Newsday and to see the Fatados doing the right thing in the community, being sincere they were. Also to see Russell Simmons signing that Rockefeller drug law bill and the mandatory minimum that was passed early this January and to know that the work that we had did to change these laws had come to fruition. 
So I'm saying to you young people, get out and vote. Work hard, because you can make a difference in changing the laws in your community. I just want to give you guys a few things to look out for in the future. We got the Rocky II Drug Law Rally. We going out there to the knockout for the Rockefeller Drug Law. We did this two years ago at City Hall with P. Diddy, Jay-Z, and a couple of other artists. 100,000 strong. We're doing it again May 6th this year at City Hall. Also, I want you to look out for Magic Johnson coming through Queens. We're going to have him speak about HIV, AIDS awareness. Also, look out for the program we're going to be doing at the high school for law enforcement. $130 million facility located on Guy Rural Boulevard, across the street from Basie Projects, where a lot of destruction was, uh, was born. So we're going to be launching a couple of programs out of there. And we also got a partnership with Hot 97 and the Hip Hop House Hop Foundation. So we're going to be out there grinding. Just look out. I'm going to reflect on two of the darkest moments in our last 500 year history. I'm talking about the Atlantic slave trade where African Americans lost their life in Nazi Germany. You see, Adolf Hitler had some laws that definitely were racist against a population, Jews. Yes, believe the hype. Believe the hype. Those laws were meant to destroy an ethnic group. You see, Hitler hated Jews, gays, he hated gypsies, blacks. He had a plan of genocide. And believe the hype when the Jews are telling you this. Read the history of Nazi Germany. Because in order for you to change laws like the Jim Crow laws that still exist on the books in South Carolina, the Rockefeller drug laws, you got to know your history. So study your history, read these books. Hitler took drugs. He injected drugs every day. He was on amphetamines. His doctor shot him full of drugs. Methadone was named after him. I'm only tying in some history because believe the hype of what happened in Nazi Germany because it can happen to you. Read, study laws around you, get out and vote. Take this seriously. The Rockefeller drug laws are detrimental and they can't destroy you. So this anti-drug documentary is to educate you, but for you also to educate yourself. So therefore, be careful, know what you're getting into, and read about your history. Thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the film. That is not easy. Soldiers with Lisa Evers. I want to introduce our panel um, to you. We have Elaine Bartlett with us. She's a survivor of the Rockefeller drug laws. She did 16 years of a 20 to life sentence for selling four ounces of Coke. She was a first time offender when it happened. She's also the subject of a new book that's called Life on the Outside. Um, also with us is Anthony Papa. He's the author of um, a book called 15 to Life, How I Painted My Way to Freedom. Um, he did 12 years under the Rockefeller drug laws and uh, like Elaine is an activist against them now. Anthony, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate it. Also with us is Lance Furtado. If you've seen uh, the current issue of Feds Magazine, his is the face that's on the cover of Feds Magazine. He did 10 years for a drug conspiracy charge. He's out of Southside, Queens, out of South Jamaica, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Lance, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Also with us, Judge Jerome Marks. I think this is the first time ever in Street Soldiers history we've had a former state Supreme Court justice with us. I was sentenced to 20 in life for a first time offender. I was a mother of four children. My kids were nine, six, two, and one at the time. I was living in Wagner Projects on welfare, paying $127 a month for rent. I didn't own anything. I wasn't a kingpin. I didn't have anything. They offered me a five to life if I would agree to come back to Manhattan and been a informer. But going back to the projects, who ha would I have set up but someone similar to myself? Because I didn't know any kingpins. 
And I did 16 years in Bethel Hills Correctional Facility, Maximum Facility for Women. In the 16 years that I served, I didn't meet one kingpin in that prison with me. The money that they spend to house us in prison, I mean, I did 16 years. There's so many other things that could have been done with me. They could have put me under house arrest. They could have educated me so I could have been a better mother for my children. They could have had me do community services. There's just so many other things that could have been done with me besides housing me for 16 years. I, I passed an envelope for four and a half ounces of cocaine for $500. I ran it up from the Bronx to Mount Vernon, New York. I was set up in a sting operation. This individual uh, worked for the police. He had three sealed indictments. The more people he got involved, the less time he got. Uh, so I brought the envelope. Twenty cops came out of nowhere. I was placed under arrest. I did everything I could wrong, and I was sentenced to two 15-year life terms. The judge gave me a break in Westchester County because it was my first offense. If you read my book, it's an interesting story. There was more drugs in that prison than it was in the street. And my whole point was, and saying this, is that if you can't control drugs in a controlled environment like prison, how could you control it in a free society? Since 1982, 33 prisons have been built in rural upstate communities and, and, and Republican territories. 75% of those individuals, those 19,000 individuals, come from the inner city. Prosecutors live and, dead and die by their rates of conviction. It's basically people that cop out because the people that stand up and fight, it's a 50-50 chance. And it's not that, you know, they're putting pressure on you for you to give somebody up. They'll put pressure on you to make you cop out. I believe the 14th Amendment says that slave is against the law unless you're in prison. So I think that the Rockefeller laws are the most unjust laws ever enacted in my time. There's never been another law that has been so unjust and, 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 and a ridiculous kind of law. It makes no sense at all. Now, under the law, the law was enacted in 1973. The governor of Rockefeller was the governor at that time. And if uh, under the law, if you sell two ounces of hard drugs, cocaine or heroin of that sort, or you possess over four or four ounces or more, you're faced with a mandatory minimum the same as murder. Minimum of 15 years to life, 15 to 25 years to life. Yeah. Yeah. You don't 